Good morning and welcome to Trinity Lutheran Church. It is March 29th, 2020. And we welcome you for worship on this, the fifth Sunday of Lent. Oh, next week is Palm Sunday. My, how time flies by when you're having fun, or maybe you're not having so much fun, but we pray that this worship service might be a blessing for you as we gather together as God's people, both near and far, to gather around His Word, around prayer, around song, and around an opportunity for us to sing as well. And I know some, for some of you it's a little awkward to sing when you're all by yourself, and, or maybe it's awkward to sing with your husband or wife in the room or with your kids in the room. That's okay. Use the voice that God has given you as we sing today. Today is a Hymn Sing Sunday. Uh, a number of you made a variety of selections that were put on Facebook. And so we went through and collected all those and uh, winnowed it down to five. And we're going to choose three of those for our hymn sing, but the other two will be used for our opening hymn and our closing hymn. I think it would be appropriate for me to grab one of those right now so that we can find out what our opening hymn is going to be. So I'm going to go do that. With those things in mind, God's blessings to you. I'll announce the next hymn, and then Candace is going to go ahead and play that song for us as our opening for our service this day. God's peace be with you. All right, what do we have here? Ah, we've got this tray. It's not being used for anything else, so uh, we'll go ahead and select the first one for our opening for today. And it is What a Friend We Have in Jesus. That's hymn number 770. What a friend we have in Jesus. We will have the words up on the screen for you so you can sing along. I'm willing to bet, though, that a lot of you already know this by heart. God's blessings as we worship you.
certainly need songs like that in these times. Our order of worship will begin as we call upon God's name and we invite his presence to be with us in each of our homes as he gathers together his baptized children. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our psalm for today is Psalm 130. It's the appointed psalm, and a very appropriate psalm, psalm for us as well. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord, more than watchmen for the morning, more than watchmen for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is plentiful redemption. redemption and he will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. We join then in our scripture readings, our scripture lessons. Our Old Testament lesson for this, the fifth Sunday in Lent, is from Ezekiel chapter 37. This is the text, I've preached it a countless uh, times for funerals, uh, the Valley of Dry Bones. We hear these words. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord, and set me down in the middle of the valley. It was full of bones. And he led me around among them, and behold, there were very many in the, on the surface of the valley, and behold, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, Prophesy over these bones, and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you, and will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a sound, and behold, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. And I looked, and behold, there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. And then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet an exceedingly great army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. We are clean cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people. And I will bring you into the land of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves, and raise you from your graves, O my people. And I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live, and I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. I have spoken, and I will do it, declares the Lord. And that ends our Old Testament lesson, our epistle lesson from Romans chapter 8. St. Paul writes, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. To set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, 
for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. And that ends our epistle lesson. Our gospel lesson is the account of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. It is taken from John chapter 11. It's a long portion of text, that is for sure. Uh, it's 45 verses, and so that's a bit long. I'll do my best to read. You do your best to focus. It might help for you to open up your own Bible so you can follow along with your eyes as you're engaging all of your senses. If you can't hear that, it's raining pretty hard right now. From John chapter 11, I'll give you a little bit of time to open up there. That text is uh, very appropriate as it is leading us towards Palm Sunday, towards Holy Week, and of course Easter itself as we celebrate the resurrection. But Jesus is showing his authority over death here, the death of others. It's his death that he dies that makes no sense to us because he has no sin. But we get the first gleanings that he has power over death, not only for others, but it is a foreshadowing of his power over death, even for himself, as God the Father raises him from the grave. Again, John chapter 11, we start at verse 1. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and his sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters went to him, saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, This illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, Let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and are you going there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles, because the light is not in him. After saying these things, he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to wake, awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought that he meant taking rest in sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died. And for your sake I am glad that I was not there, so that you may believe. But let us go to him. So Thomas called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us also go, there we may die with him. Now when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, but Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And anyone, everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. When she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in private, The teacher is here and is calling for you. When she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but he was still in the place where Martha had met him. 
When the Jews who were with her in the house consoling her saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deep, deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. And he said, Where have you, I'm sorry, so the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me. But I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. When he said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out! The man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary had seen what he did, believed in him. And that ends our gospel reading. We'll continue in our service then with our hymn sing. We'll reset for that and we'll invite you to come back and to sing and to listen as uh, we spend some time in God's Word. On to hymn sing. A uh, virtual hymn sing, I guess, kind of in a way. So I can't uh, try to find hands up in the uh, audience. Or in the corner, there's a hand up, Andrew. Uh, <laughs> there are no hands up, but we did get some selections. And so I'll go back to our, our, our plate here, and I'm going to pull one out, and we will find out what it is. Uh, the selection here is Rock of Ages, hymn number 761. Rock of Ages, and let me find that for us. And Rock of Ages, Cleft for Me, it's got four verses. They're a little bit shorter, so we'll go ahead and we'll sing all four verses. And then I'll spend a little bit of time talking about it. So go ahead and start singing.
first, the last line, foul I to the fountain fly. Foul. You all know it's getting close to being baseball time, although we may have to walk, wait to watch a little bit of that, but a foul ball. That means that the hitter hit the ball. It just is across the line. It's trespassed, if you will. It, it went on either the right side of first base or the left side of third base and therefore is considered out of play. You don't want to hit a foul ball because that means that it's a strike. It's a strike against you. How many strikes do you have against you when it comes to fall, uh, flying uh, afoul of what God has intended for us? You know so well God's law. At least many of you do. You know that first commandment, I shall have no other gods. You may know that fourth commandment, honor your father and mother. How about that fifth commandment, you shall not murder. That sixth commandment, you shall not commit adultery. That tenth commandment, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, manservant, maidservant, animal, ox, or donkey. I haven't coveted anybody's donkey that I'm aware of, but definitely I follow, I, I run afoul of God's law. I trespass against it. It's what we pray in the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. In this hymn, we talk about that foul, foul I fly, I, I to the fountain fly, wash me, Savior, or I die. Our gospel lesson for today is Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. Remember, they were so concerned and, and, and they thought, if you'd only been here, Lord, Lazarus wouldn't have died. You would have been able to heal him, but now he's dead and it's too late, so you might as well just go back to what you were doing as if God doesn't care. Do you feel like God doesn't care? I've asked you this question before, but now it's maybe even a little bit more different, a, a little bit more universal pain is felt for us. For those of you with sm small businesses or that are having to shutter or trying to figure out how to eke out just enough funds to pay your employees, Oh, the struggles. Oh, the pain. And maybe some of you are, are tight on a job, tight on money. And maybe you're going to lose your job and you don't know what to do or how to handle it. You see, not only do we uh, fly a foul, so also the world around us because it's changed by sin. Yet we have a rock of ages, one who is the same yesterday, today, and always, namely Jesus Christ, our God on high who does not change, our God who promises not to fall asleep, our God who promises to keep his eye on the sparrow and his eye on you. That water and blood mixed from your ribbon side, your cut through side, the text says in our hymn, water and blood that flowed from a ready dead body. Christ our Lord on the cross. Remember the soldier comes with that club. It was tradition to break the legs of the people on the cross because oftentimes the crucifixion didn't kill them and they didn't want them limping away. So breaking their legs would make it so that they couldn't possibly exhale anymore and they would eventually die. They hit the legs of the one criminal and the legs of the other criminal, and they came to Jesus. The soldier looked up and he said, he's already dead, I can tell. To make absolutely certain, he takes his pila or his javelin or a spear, and he pierces our Lord's side, straight to the heart, pulling back. And as he does, water and blood come pouring out. Water is what keeps us alive. Water is that which cleanses and makes whole and new again. It's a reminder of our baptisms. Without water, we surely will die. Blood is the very thing, the very essence of our lives. It's what courses through your veins right now as you listen to me. And we may talk about our blood boiling or our blood has grown, grown cold, but our blood, as long as it is flowing through the body, is cycling through, making sure that we are alive. But I'm here to tell you today, you are dying. It's no, no uh, secret, it's no hidden thing. You and I are dying. From the moment we were conceived, when God created us and knit us together in our mother's wombs, we have been dying. And that process is going on. But remember, he gave his life for you. 
that that water and blood which mixed together flowed out of his body meant that though you and I die physical deaths, we have no need of dying a spiritual death, an eternal death. And that is the hope that will see us through this difficult time. That is the hope that has seen you through all kinds of difficult times in your lives. We can continue to know that there is a sure, solid rock that spans all the ages, that is the foundation of our faith, that is the hope wherein we look forward to being with him forever. May the Lord grant you peace in this time. May you know that he holds you together, that even when we fall, when we fly afoul of his law, that he, in our repentant cries, hears our prayer and forgives us. Know you are forgiven. Amen. All right, another selection. We'll find one in here. Is, uh, let's go with this one. Go, my children, with my blessing. Hymn number 922. And I think, I'm imagining that parents, uh, married couples, may be under a little bit more stress now, especially those of you with little ones. Uh, we're so used to going off to our jobs and not seeing each other and then coming back. And, and, and uh, that, you know, as they say, fondness makes the heart grow warmer towards, or, I'm sorry, so distance makes the heart grow more fond. And so uh, now we're kind of cramped in together and maybe causing a little bit of stress for you and your spouse, maybe between you and the kids. I think it would be appropriate. To, there is a special verse for this hymn, hymn number 922, um, uh, Go My Children With My Blessing, that is intended for weddings, for marriages. And how appropriate it might be for us to sing that, to be reminded of that gift of the foundation for a family in a married couple. So we'll sing verses 1, 2, We'll substitute it in that special verse, and then we'll close off with verse 4. God's blessing as we sing.
curse till death do us part. Whew. It all becomes very real on your wedding day when you're standing in front of your love and you're looking them in the eye and you recite those words as the pastor says them. Hopefully he's breaking it up into smaller sections so that you don't forget what he said and all of your uh, over exuberance of, of excitedness and look like a fool. In sickness and in health, in good times and in bad times, till death do we part. That's the commitment you made when you got married, at least for those of you who have been married. It's not only a commitment, it's, it's an honest oath. It's an oath before God and in front of all kinds of people. It is attested to on a legal document. And it means that in that moment, that no matter the things that come to break us asunder, as Jesus says, let nothing that man can possibly do cast this union asunder, that we are committed to one another. Those of you who have been married for longer than ten minutes know things happen. Anger continues to work. All the, the sins that you struggled with before that marriage now get magnified as they come into a union. And it comes from both sides, and so those sins multiply, and they usually feed off of each other, and they fester, and they manifest themselves in all kinds of terrible ways. Oh, the, the, the terrible plans that Satan has arrayed against God's creation uh, to break everything that God had given us hurt and to harm, to divide and conquer. We do better when we're united. That's true for a nation. It's true for a family, and it's certainly true for a marriage, the foundation of a family. I pray that you as married couples have your foundation on Christ. If it's struggling, if that foundation seems to be wobbling, I would encourage you, get it strengthened. Do so by being in God's Word, being in worship. Do it by praying. Do it by being fervent in spirit, because Satan, that prowling lion, he's always seeking to come along and spring on us to devour and divide and to conquer. Go, my children, with my blessings, never alone. Waking, sleeping, I am with you. You are my own. We could gush on about 1 Corinthians 13 and how we're to love one another. But you know as well as I that our love for each other is, well, frankly, it's flawed. We want to have a perfect love for each other, but it's so easy to become very selfish with that love. But our God loves perfectly. That's why the language in this hymn is really ultimately about him. That's why the language in 1 Corinthians 13 is all about his love that he's had for you. It goes like this. God demonstrates his own love for you in this, that while you were still sinners, broken and battered, Christ Jesus died for you. When you were at your worst, God was at his best. He gave his son as a ransom to purchase you back from sin, death, Satan, and Hell. That special verse in that song goes like this, In this union I have joined you. Never forget who it is that brought you together. It was not some dating site. It was not some friend. It was not uh, just by chance. But God unites you. He put each of you in front of each other. And he molds you and makes you, not only as individuals, but also as a couple and as a family. Be strengthened, my dear friends. Be strengthened. Husband and wife, now my children live together as heirs of life, each the other's gladness sharing, each the other's burdens bearing. Now my children live together as heirs of life. Inheritance. I remember when I started putting that together as a kid, the idea that if your parents die, you get their stuff. It was a very rudimentary kind of understanding, but I remember being in my parents' bedroom, and my dad was laying on his bed, and I went in there, 
and for some reason we were talking about baseball cards and the baseball cards he had, and I thought, wow, it'd be kind of cool to have all the cards my dad does. And so I said, man, I can't wait for you to die because then I get your baseball cards. I'm embarrassed even to bring that story up again, but it illustrates so well our flawed understanding of what inheritance is. It's not about physical things. It's not about money. It's not about land. It's not about possessions. The inheritance that we were given by our gracious God and that we leave for generations to come is summed up in those words from Romans 5, verse 8. They're summed up in those words from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8, 9, and 10. They are God's word that is the true inheritance that is an absolute blessing for generations to come. If you're struggling as husband and wife, if you're struggling all on your own, reminded that Christ is within you, that you're, you're, you're filled up with the spirit that was poured out in your baptisms. You may be strengthened in your position, whatever that may be, as husband, wife, as, as maybe a single individual, maybe it's as a son or a daughter or a grandchild, maybe it's as an uncle or an aunt, maybe it's as a friend or a neighbor. Be a blessing to one another. Don't be a burden. If you become burdensome when it becomes all about you, but set aside self and talk to the other one. Ask them how their day is. Talk to them. Open up those lines of communication. And where forgiveness needs to be asked for, ask for it. And where forgiveness is asked, make sure that the other one forgives. We do better when we are united. Go, my children, fed and nourished, closer to him. Amen. One final selection. Let's grab it. Uh, there's two in here. One will be our closing hymn, but I'll choose this one for our hymn sing. Uh, number 763, When Peace Like a River. Oh, so appropriate. All these hymns are appropriate for our days and times. When Peace Like a River, hymn number 763, we'll sing all the verses. If you don't get that refrain quite right, that's okay. Take the up part, take the down part. Either way, just sing to the Lord.
less ridiculous, I think, if we were all gathered here in the sanctuary, but I would ask you to do it in your homes. I want you to shout out, come Lord Jesus, come quickly, all right? Count of three, one, two, three, come Lord Jesus, come quickly. One more time, come Lord Jesus, come quickly. Your life is like a book. I'm not much of a reader. I've read some books, but your life is like a book. Chapter is written, page by page. And then we have to get to the next chapter, and we turn that page, and there it is, chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4, and so on. Each chapter is a little different from the other, yet we always hold on to and maintain the things that happened before that influence each page, each chapter change. That hymn, When Peace Like a River. There's a lot to be said about the author of the words, Horatio Spafford. I would encourage you to go online, just go to YouTube, type in Horatio Spafford, uh, type in When Peace Like a River. I'm sure there's all kinds of good videos there about how it is that he came to write those most marvelous words. Each page in his life seemed to get worse and worse and worse. Bad thing upon bad thing. Oh, there were good things too, but each chapter seemed to introduce more pain, more sorrow, more hurt. And yet he cries out in an inordinate way, It is well with my soul. It is well. Pray that things are well with you, too. You may not be able to sleep well at night because of fear and anxiety. Some of you, I know, are facing the reality of cancer. Some of you are facing the reality of, again, lost jobs, lost wages, difficulties on either hand. But be assured that as Job declared in his marvelous book, that as things were being taken away from him, left and right, even when he lost all of his children, as that house collapsed and ended their lives, he was so bold, moved by the Spirit of God to declare, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be his name. Blessed assurance. Jesus is mine. Satan is going to try to take you. He's already got his next plan devised. He's probably already set it in motion, how to capture you, how to trip you up, how to make you feel as though you are lesser and insignificant. And all the more louder we need to cry out, Come, Lord Jesus, come quickly, and the winds will blow, and the storms will batter. You will turn the page on to the next chapter. And Lord willing, we're still standing. It's like the old adage, if it doesn't kill you, it just makes you stronger. And we pray that the Lord would strengthen us even through these crosses. Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me. We all have different crosses, different things that burden us and weigh us down. Your master, your Lord says, give it to me. For it was on his cross that all your pain, all your shame, all of your sin was laid. Jesus says about his burden, my burden is easy, my yoke is very light. You know why? Because he said you are worth it. He said each of you watching, every one of you who know the Lord, you are all worth it. Even the ones who have rejected, even the ones who have walked away, you are still worth it, and God doesn't give up, and we use these times and these awful chapters of our lives to see the contrast of Satan's darkness 
to the marvelous light of Christ until we turn that final page and everybody has the same end story in this life anyways, and that is Christ coming as the sky is opened up and he descends from on high and every knee bows and every tongue confesses Jesus to be Lord. Come, Lord Jesus, come quickly. And yea, he says, I am coming, and I am coming soon. So know him. Find strength in him. And trust always in his words. That I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me, Jesus says. May your faith be strengthened in these difficult times. That we may call upon him. And that we together can cry out those words, Come, Lord Jesus, come quickly. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, may it guard and keep your hearts and minds in faith in Christ Jesus to life everlasting. Amen. Instead of trying to list out all kinds of prayer requests, and we do have several, I want to just close by joining voices with you to say the Lord's Prayer. It's a perfect prayer. It sums up all of our needs, all of our cares, all of our concerns as we take them to Him, as we cry out to our Father. So if you would join with me in that, we'll close then with the benediction, and we'll sing our final hymn. We've got to find out which hymn that is. We pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Receive the blessing of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor, and may he give you his peace. Amen. Let's find out what our last hymn will be. Lord of the Dance. That's from All God's People Sing, hymn number 170. You probably don't have that, but have no fear. The words are coming up.
don't have a whole lot of announcements for you. Obviously, things have been canceled and postponed and everything uh, all over the place. We will just let those things take care of themselves as time goes on. We'll continue to come to you online uh, via Facebook, YouTube. Also, all these videos should be up on our webpage. Also, we will be continuing to broadcast them as best we can from uh, Sunday to Sunday on Spectrum, also on Thursdays too. I would encourage you to stay connected if you've got concerns, questions, if you just need to visit, give me a holler. I've been uh, having visits with people in my office, I'm willing to do it through Zoom as well. Uh, whatever the case may be, we will do the best we can in the things that God has given to us. Uh, look forward to our homepage coming out. It'll be a week later than usual. Uh, we're going to call it the Easter edition. So uh, look, uh, keep your eyes peeled for that in your mailboxes too. With those thoughts in mind then, God's peace be with you this week. We appreciate all the work of the many people who are uh, coming together to make these services and these things happen. We appreciate so much our musicians, uh, Candace uh, playing for us again, Margaret, I'm sure we'll get Lyle in there too, and uh, we just thank God for all of them. Uh, don't forget uh, uh, Rebecca Zims too, uh, helped out on Wednesday service, so uh, we just thank God for the gift of so many talents, and we'll continue to seek opportunity to use those. Have a blessed week.